Shalom, shalom, and welcome to our midweek Bible study where we're always looking to discover more facets of our great and wonderful God. This Bible study is titled The Believers in the End Time as we're covering different letters of the Brit Hadasha, that is the New Testament, emphasizing the believer's behavior, conduct, and action during this period leading to the rapture, leading to the end times. Now let us open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3 to recap the introduction from the previous study. This is where we encounter the second of the five warnings found in the book of Hebrews, which runs to the end of the ch of chapter 4. The first one was the danger of drifting away. The second is the danger of unbelief and disobedience. This is one pitfall which we ought to watch today. According to the prophecies of the, of the body of the Messiah in the end times, falling from the faith is the one danger that looms over the believers. For Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. First, we have deceitful spirits roaming the places where believers are, that is, in the congregations of God. These spirits may refer to false teachers or demons or both working together in unison. The second clause that we read concerning the doctrines of demons, this is where demonic activities are most active. It, it, it attacks the Word of God, the Bible. Remove the Bible from the life of the believer and you have no more direction, no more vision, but instead chaos. The word follow is aphis temi in the same root of apostasy, which itself speaks of a divorcement. This is when one divorces God as it pertains to those who in unbelief pretend to believe, took advantage of the benefits, but finally left it. So today, faith becomes even more precious as it will be the object of attack from what the Spirit calls doctrines of demons. Some within the body of the Messiah have already begun to challenge the fundamental doctrines of the Bible, such as the divinity of the Messiah and the Trinity itself, disturbing the faith of many. This is where the major battle is situated. This is the time to build a strong fence around these major doctrines of the Bible, for they will be the subject of many assaults. Let us now see how the book of Hebrews deal with this peril and where we should concentrate to better fight this battle. Sharon will read for us verses 1 to 6 from Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus the Messiah, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Messiah as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end." Now, our text begins with the word, therefore, as if to say, finally, now, after all that has been said and shown in the previous two chapters, what are we going to do with all this information about Yeshua, about Jesus? How applicable is it in our life? In this section, the writer obviously speaks to believers. He calls them holy brothers in verse 1. And to them, he begins this great encouragement by including two more important titles of the Messiah. These would be four titles out of the seven that he brings out in this book. The first title we encounter, if you remember, was Heir in chapter 1, verse 2. The second was the Captain of our Salvation in chapter 2, verse 10. And here are added two more, Apostle and High Priest. These titles which furthers our understanding of our relationship with the Messiah. See how he directs our attention to him for keeping our hope heavenward. 
This makes it so much easier, by the way, to fight the earthly battles and to strengthen our faith. Let us look at the third one, the apostle. In the New Testament, this word means to be sent, to be sent as Yeshua was sent from heaven to earth. However, there is much more to this word. Before this word found its place in the New Testament, in secular Greek, they, they used it. They use this word apostle as a title of a commander who was leading a military expedition. It was the title given to one who was heading the great naval journey. You know, at that time, not all parts of the world were discovered, of course. And it must have been so exciting to organize great journeys into the unknown. And the leader of the exper expedition was called the apostle. There was so much excitement connected with this designation. It is as if the believer was called to a great journey of exploration and discovery. And such is or should be the life of one who walks with Yeshua. Biblical Judaism, biblical Christianity is not boring at all. The writer wants us, he wants to tell us that it could be the most exciting experience yet. And there's a progression in these titles. From being heir, he always was in eternity. To him belongs all things. He then became the captain of our salvation in his death and resurrection. And now he is back up in heaven. He is our apostle in our walk, in our sanctification. He is the one who goes before us to pave the way so we can partner with him in this great work. We explore the world and our circumstances with him. The following title, the fourth in the, in the book of Hebrews is High Priest. This one speaks of intercession. This one tells us that heaven is open now to all believers and we can now boldly as the Bible says, enter the throne of God in his name. This last title has, in fact, tremendous implications. It is loaded with great truth. Let us make a brief review of the importance of the high priest in the Mosaic law. From there, we can better appreciate Jesus' presence title. In the Hebrew scripture, the high priest position was right below God. He was the mediator. He was the intercessor for the people. He not only spoke to God on behalf of the people, he taught the people how to live through God. He was their supreme earthly leader, and this position plays a big role in the book of Hebrews, as this title, by the way, is mentioned 16 times. Remember how elaborate his outfit is, that is the high priest outfit in the Old Testament. It was designed to show the immense responsibility he had. He was wearing a breastplate with the name of the 12, uh, uh, 12 tribes uh, engraved on, on it. He was responsible for them. He was wearing a crown which says holiness to the Lord because he was to typify what holiness is. If you ever wonder what might have been the most demanding job ever, it was that of the high priest. And we are further told that when he sinned, all Israel took on the responsibility. We read this phrase, this, this powerful phrase in Leviticus chapter 4 verse 3. If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, meaning that the consequences of his sins will fall on the people, but with Yeshua as high priest, we run no risk at all because he is sinless. And in the Hebrew scriptures, this high priest was the only man in the world to have the right to approach God's presence in the most holy place in the tabernacle. Remember on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, only the high priest could enter the very holy place and it was the only time when he was asked to change his garment to enter with just a linen uh, tunic to typify the first coming and where we see the death of the Messiah. And the days before Yom Kippur, the, the other priests were afraid for the high priest's life. They would themselves lock him up in the chambers of the temple and go all over the details over and over again. They understood the stakes. They feared for his life. And with all of this, the Spirit asks us to consider who really is the apostle and high priest of our confession at this present time. 
to consider is to look at it in a reflective manner, to contemplate, to meditate on who our Savior is. The Greek word is metokos, from the word eco. We get the word eco. You know how it is when you are surrounded by mountains and there is an eco? It is a place where the words resonate many times over and over. Now, while the first high priest was Aaron in the Hebrew scriptures, there was one man higher than him. It was Moses, who more than Aaron played the role of high priest. And so it is at this time when the author compares Moses to the Messiah. Let's not forget that in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews deals with some Messianic Jews who contemplated going back to the law and to Pharisaic Judaism for the battle was very fierce. There was a lot of persecution. And so the spirit goes right to the one who brought the law to the people, Moses. And while the writer will speak highly of Moses, he will, however, say that the Messiah is so much higher than Moses. It is then in verse 2 of chapter 3 where we have the first of 11 mentions of the name Moses in the book of Hebrews. He here begins with a positive note. Speaking of Yeshua, he says in verse 2, He was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was in all his house. And indeed, he was. Looking at the account of this man in the Torah, among the Israelites, one cannot find a higher or better positioned man in relation to God than Moses. He is the one who spoke to God mouth to mouth. This is a testimony of Numbers chapter 12, where God says, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. This is Numbers 12, verses 6 to 8. And I want to tell you, this is quite a testimony coming from God himself. This is why Moses is the highest ranked individual in Judaism, especially at the time when the book of Hebrews actually was written. Many at the time of the writing of Hebrews viewed the Messiah as the second Moses, especially the Ebionites, who were a, a group of Messianic Jews who dragged the law with them into the new dispensation, very much like we see today in North America. For them, the law was still in operation and they put Moses and Jesus at par. For them, these, two, these were equal, just like we see again in many congregations here. Because of the prominence of this man, Moses, the writer of Hebrews, needed to address this issue seriously. Furthermore, Moses testified of the coming Messiah and clearly placed him above himself, of course, and anyone else. It is in Deuteronomy chapter 18 where Moses spoke of the Messiah in the same way the writer of Hebrews actually speaks of him. See what it says in verses 15 and 19. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Him, the Messiah, Moses says, you shall hear. Why this clause? You know, the people were not always obedient to the words of Moses. In fact, they were seldom obedient to his words. But with the one to come, they could not find the luxury of being rebellious. And God himself confirms the words of Moses in verse 19. Whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him, says the Lord. This is precisely what he said again in the book of Hebrews. The word here is the same word for obey. Obey. This verse asks the Israelites and everyone else obedience to the Messiah. And Moses himself seems to have been aware of his overwhelming position and humbly voiced his inability to, to, for the task. Have you noticed how the book of Deuteronomy begins? If Moses was such a great mediator as they thought he was, Deuteronomy will not have begun the way it begins. Right at the start, Moses, in his humility, said that he was not up to the job. 
In chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, in verse 9 and verse 12, we read, And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. And verse 12, How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? You see, all along we see a tired Moses, right? That, that, that is in the book of Deuteronomy. As great a man that he, as he was, he could not take the place of Yeshua. In his failures and in his great humility again, he, he succeeded like no other to point to the Messiah. Moses then was so esteemed in the eyes of the Jews at this time, and this is why in our text the argument of Hebrews is that who is worth more, the creator or the creation? Speaking of, of Jesus, in verse 3, we are told, For this one, Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Moses is the house, and we are the house. But the Messiah is the builder, the creator. One cannot compare one from the other. And in the next argument, the Spirit says that Moses is a servant, but Jesus is the Son. This is what it says. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. And verse 6, it says, but the Messiah was faithful as a son over his house. Who then is superior, the servant or the son? The son, of course. Why then are you comparing or contemplating changing what is worth so much for something to that is worth much less? These Israelites, like many today, were contemplating leaving the newfound faith and go back to the law. In the same way today, some are slowly drifting away from the faith to go back to the things of the world and the traditions of the elders as opposed to the pure word of God. So Yeshua is a, our apostle and high priest. And verse 1 adds that he is the high priest of our confession. Our confession, this is the Greek term homolokia, which means to say the same thing, to agree with. This is where we get our, homo, our word homogenes, which means the same kind or the, of the same nature. The word homologia was important in secular Greek. In Socrates' writings, it indicates a consent to what is found to be valid, followed by the appropriate resolve and action. Just like a paper argument or verbal argument was not enough, this word required action. And this is where the writer removes his gloves and begins to enumerate the other's ifs. ifs. In verse 6, he says, but Messiah as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. The word house, again, is the believer, the fellowship. It is the place where those who belong to God gather. And how do you recognize them? According to Hebrews, it refers to those who hold fast to the end. And if there's an if, it is because many do not hold fast. Yes, this is the characteristic of a believer to hold strongly to the things of God in their journey towards the promised land that is heaven itself. Freedom is not the right to do as a person pleases, but the liberty to do as he out. This is where true freedom, it requires obedience and conformity to the word of God, for it is so easy to drift away and follow the majority. Do you remember the word overcome? Overcome. Jesus used it seven times, one for each of the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Each time it designates the believer and what he will give them afterwards. And the eighth and last time he mentions this word overcome is actually in Revelation 21, 7 at the end. This is what he says. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. And this is a treaty on obedience and faith. What does it mean to believe? Obedience, persistent, persistence that is must be present. We're going to learn that as believers and followers of the Messiah, there's no harmony in the heart without obedience. There's no rest, no peace without it. And selected obedience is no obedience at all. This is when it becomes convenience, but we ought to obey 
all the Lord as much as we can, of course. It is through persistence in the faith that great men of God came about. And these did not fall from the sky. They also persisted in their faith. There's a lot of work behind it. You know, the, the writer will bring at this point, especially when we get to Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith. But even in the world, behind great men and women, there's a life of preparation, a life of obedience and persistence. And it is now in the book of Hebrews that the Spirit is about to give us one great example in history, that is Israel. Now pay attention to what happened to them in the example that we're about to read. This story is given to us because we are so much like them. You see, the events of, of the story takes place in the wilderness, but it is not taken directly from the original source of the Torah. It is cited from Psalm 95, a perfectly selected psalm for the occasion. Now let's read what the book of Hebrews chapter 3 tells us from verse 7 to 11. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. You see, after telling us all about Yeshua, who Yeshua is, and all that he did for us. Now the scriptures tell us today, if you hear his voice. To the unbelievers, actually this is a call to salvation. You know by now who Jesus is, right? If you're in the chapter 3, by now you know who he is. Now today, if you understand who he is, do not harden your hearts, because you don't know if by tomorrow you're going to see the same thing. But now... How should we, believers in Yeshua, read this warning? What does it tell us? The Spirit brings us right into the wilderness at a place called Kadesh Barnea. Let us consider the context of the story of verses 7 to 11. There was a turning point in the history of the Jewish people. After they had left Egypt, a year or so later, they found themselves right at the door of the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, but they could not get hold of it. At this time, Moses sent 12 spies to find the best way to enter the land. And the spies actually stayed 40 days. And when they came back, 10 of these spies panicked when they saw the power of the enemy. They saw an insurmountable obstacle. They saw these giants and they forgot who the Lord was. And they came back, when they came back to camp, they discourage the people to go in and take the land, and as a consequence, they lost their blessings. As a punishment, they were to stay in the wilderness, walk around and around to and fro the encampment of Kadesh Barnea for 40 years. Uh, one year for each of the days they were in the land, until the people of that generation, 20 years old and over, that is, died, except two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, a Jew and a Gentile. This represents a picture, by the way, of the new body of the Messiah to come. But for now, the point of all is that because of their unbelief, the people forfeited so many blessings. And this is where the story speaks to us. Let me show you a map. See, this map illustrates the journey of the Israelites and that of so many believers today. The first thing that we notice is that from Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai, where they got the law. And from Mount Sinai to the promised land, you know, the land of rest. This is actually a journey of only 11 days, just about 150 kilometers. Now, it wasn't long at all. This is what Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 2 tells us. The book of Deuteronomy opens with that sad fact. It was 11 days turning to 40, day, 40 years, that is, because of unbelief. And as the Israelites were coming to take possession of their land, they actually lost a good part of their blessings because, again, of unbelief. Because of unbelief, they could not enter the blessings of their, of their possessions. It was then delayed, held up, until today, by the way, until the Messiah will come back. Now, let me explain. 
one can clearly see this in the book of Deuteronomy. At the beginning, the extent of the land was given to the Israelites. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 7, God gave them the size, actually, of the land. This is what we read. Turn and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains and in the lowland, in the south and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See what the Lord gave the Israelites? The land, all the land from Egypt to Iraq, right? And now was the time. It was as if the millennium was about to start thick the land for yourself. But something happened between the giving of the promise in verse 7 and the time the new generation was about to go and take possession of the land. The sin of disobedience, the sin of Kadesh Barnea, this is when the language of the Torah changes. Now, if God gave them this whole land, why is it that when the, this new generation arrived 38 years later, God told them in verse 2, speaking of the land of the Edomites, which was included in the original promise, but now he says to them firmly, don't touch it. Look at verse 7, verse 5. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. What do you think they lost the territory of Edom? Why is it? See that the promise was delayed because of sin. He also tells them in verse 9 concerning the land of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the descendants of Lot as a possession. And with Edom and Moab, he adds in verse 19, the land of Ammon. And when you come near the people of Ammon, do not harass them or meddle with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the descendants of Lot as a possession. Do you see how the blessings dwindled with time? Why has the land dwindled from verse 7? God did not make a covenant with Edom, nor with Moab, nor with Ammon. In fact, at the end, during the messianic time, during the millennium, we learn that Israel will occupy this very land. Through the prophet Obadiah, for instance, God says in verse 19, the south shall possess the mountains of Esau. That is, those Jews that shall dwell in the southern part of the land of Judea shall seize upon the country of Edom. And it is the same with the territory of Ammon and Moab. And then that land was part of the original promise, but it became smaller and smaller as the people sinned and sinned. The reason for their missed opportunity is their lack of faith, their lack of trust in God, lack of obedience. The same thing the writer of Hebrews is bringing to us. This is why he recalls the same events. Despite the great miracles they witnessed in the wilderness, and in spite of the great cloud that still directed them day in and day out, they lacked faith and rebelled, and the consequences are over two million Israelites perished. Is this not what is often happening for believers today? At the beginning of our conversion, all doors open up, but because of this often drifting away, our blessing is delayed and delayed. But I'm going to tell you, it's never lost, never lost. It is even now time to take our possession and begin a life with God. That's all the time we have for today. I pray that the words that we have seen today richly bless you.
Don't let it.